Hi everybody, my name is Katie Vine. I'm a staff writer at Texas Monthly. Um, I know anxiety is through the roof for a lot of us right now. I know it is for me. And so um, we're presenting you this brief escape, the Texas Monthly Bedtime Stories series. Uh, I'm going to read you a story about one of my favorite topics, fried food. <laughs> uh, I pitched this story when I was really pregnant and all I could think about was fried dough. So uh, it's about the king of fried food in Texas at the State Fair. It's called I Believe I Can Fry from September 2010. Abel Gonzalez Jr., age 40, is the high priest of flying at the State Fair of Texas, which is to say the world. Since 2005, when the fair introduced the Big Tex Choice Awards, the kind of Oscars for excellence in frying, four of the little statuettes have gone to him. He has fried Coca-Cola and cookie dough and, other, and pineapple rings, among other offerings that profit dentists. Followers taste his commitment and reciprocate with enthusiasm. It's not unheard of to see groups of girls screaming as he walks through the fairgrounds. A few years back, a couple found his talent so moving they asked him to officiate their wedding. Once, a devoted fan requested that the master deep fry his vinyl wallet. After Gonzalez reluctantly complied, the young man looked at his girl and, in what must have been a serious turning point in their relationship, held the crispy billfold in the air and whooped. <laughs> Since the advent of the Big, Sex, Big Tex Choice Awards, extreme frying has become a seasonal rite. Every fall, the crowds venture out of their comfort of their air conditioning, drawn by the hiss of the Fair Park Friars. Media outlets rack their brains for puns, such as, come fry with me, that was the economist, and it's oil or nothing, Dallas Morning News. The past few years, a good deal of the attention is also focused on Gonzalez. From television, like Oprah and Today, to the farthest corners of the blogosphere, Gonzalez's work has been featured and dissected. Andrew Zimmern, the host of the popular travel show Bizarre Foods, declared him the Willy Wonka of the Texas State Fair. Oprah simply referred to him as a guru. I met Gonzalez in March at his temporary test kitchen in the Episcopal Church of the Incarnation in Dallas. He would not share with me his concept for this year, the judging as Labor Day, but he had agreed to cook for me what many people consider to be his masterpiece fried butter, which won last year's Big Tex Award for most creative food. For a man about to place frozen balls of dough-wrapped butter into a vat of oil, Gonzalez was surprisingly trim, with only full, dimpled cheeks attesting to his occasionally unhealthy diet. A Van Dyke beard and jumpy, expressive eyebrows gave him a mischievous appearance. That day, he wore jeans, cowboy boots, and a classic white chef's jacket that he was quick to downplay. I'm not a chef. This whole white coat thing really makes me uncomfortable, he said. I wear them a lot because I'm in the kitchen and blah, 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 but I'm not a chef. You know, I never claimed to be a chef. Since he only works during the three-week duration of the fair, this year it runs September 24th to October 17th, and takes off the rest of the year to travel and hang out at home with his dog, the best way to describe Gonzalez's professional life is to say he's a concessionaire, though the term undersells him the way band does the Beatles. His imagination never rests. Three years ago, for example, a beer distribution company asked him to concoct a deep-fried beer. He was able to turn the product around quickly and easily, and even if he didn't see a market for the result, the commission did get him thinking about beer. Over a six-month period, he experimented and came up with a potato chip that tasted like beer. I soaked kettle chips in his, this beer solution, and then I fried them, he said. When they come out of the fryer, they're really crisp, and I used the salt and beer-flavoring mixture to spread on top. And he didn't stop there. I was really going crazy at the time, pushing the envelope, he said. I made a one-ounce liquid that, when poured into a beer, would completely change the taste of the beer. So you could start out with Coors Light, pour this one-ounce shot into it, and it would turn into a pina colada, margarita, cosmopolitan, whatever. It would remain fizzy, but the whole taste complex would completely change. You taste like a creamy beer like Guinness or Negro Modelo, and the root beer shot made it out of this world. One can argue the merits of these concoctions, but the fact is that all of Gonzalez's creations sound pretty gross at first. They must be tasted to be judged. Gonzalez lifted the fry basket out of the oil, tossed five balls of dough onto a plate, drizzled them with honey, and dusted them with powdered sugar, coaching me all the while in the ways to avoid a squirting mess. He waited a few seconds as they cooled, then dived in, motioning for me to hurry. I popped one, bracing myself for a coating of grease, followed by mushy, salty, lardy stuff. Instead, it was the most majestic bread stuff I've ever eaten. Sweet, then doughy, then warm, with a twist at the end. A tiny pat of butter just barely starting to melt, like an opiate at the center of the world's most scandalous donut. The process of cooking food in hot oil is only slightly less ancient than roasting a carcass on an open fire. The Egyptians used goose, pork, and beef fat for frying. 
Arabian cooks prefer the unique flavor of sheep's, tat, sheep's tail fat. Worldwide, the victuals endorsed for submersion varied, but the general tenet down the ages seemed to be that just about anything was cooked better in oil. Jerry Hopkins, the author of Extreme Cuisine, the Weird and Wonderful Foods That People Eat, suggested that rats rubbed with garlic, salt, and pepper, then dunked in hot vegetable oil for six to seven minutes are, if not delicious, at least edible. But deep frying didn't find its ideal showcase until the fair phenomenon caught on, on, caught on in America in the late 19th century. Fair cookery was a way for inventive American cooks to de demonstrate creativity and resourcefulness. An exhibit of that immense pumpkin or a, an 11-ton wheel of cheese was impressive to look at, but ultimately invited a very practical question. How do you eat it? According to Warren Belasco in Meals to Come, History of the Future of Food, cooking contests arose as a solution. They're also a way of celebrating the great abundance of American farms, a kind of culinary brag. Popular demonstrations riffed on American staples such as corn, a grain that the 1893 Chicago World's Fair featured in 300 preparations, including cream of cornstarch pudding, hominy florentine, pilau, Brunswick stew, mush croquettes, cream pie, Boston bread, Victorian corn gems, and corn dodgers. Unfortunately for those present, the selection did not include a hot dog dip in cornmeal, battered and deep fried. That future treasure of the fair circuit would belong to Carl and Neil Fletcher, brothers who came to Dallas in 1930 and decided to augment their income as vaudevillians by inventing the corny dog made famous at the 1942 State Fair. We heard some fellow used a mold to put cornbread around a wiener, but that was too slow, Neil told the New York Times in an interview in 1983. So my brother started thinking and said, why not mix a batter that would stay on a weenie? So we started experimenting in the kitchen and finally came up with a batter that would stay on. It tasted like hell. When you got one that tasted okay, it wouldn't stay on the weenie. We must have tried about 60 times until we found that one that was right, and we spent another 12 years improving it. We haven't touched it since. The corny dog is unquestionably the finest concession ever created in the state, in the state of Texas. The both Fletcher brothers have since died. The fortunate Fletcher descendants, who now run the business, sell about half a million of their inventions during the run of the fair. Corny dogs routinely outsell all other state fair foods, such as funnel cakes, nachos, turkey legs, sausage on a steak, stick, roasted corn, cotton candy, anything else dispensed from the roughly 200 food booths that, and carts at the state fair. Around 80 vendors control these concessions, which are leased on a year-to-year -year basis and then often held onto fiercely by a family like the Fletchers for generations. Lots of luck to the outsider who wants in. Hundreds of applicants fight for the two or three locations that become available each year. For decades, the Fletcher brothers' awe-inspiring invention did not attract any challengers from the other sellers. That all changed in 2005. You always want to have some things new and different at the State Fair, explained Ron Black, the fair's senior vice president of food and beverage. New cars, new shows, new booths. Apparently, while visitors still look forward to their annual, annual gastronomic overload, even the most charitable confessed that their encounters had grown stale. So Black and his people devised a contest, decided to prod the concessionaires' imaginations the Big Tex Choice Awards. The process would begin with a letter sent to all State Fair of Texas concessionaires, inviting them to mail in a description of a new and audacious dish. Next, a committee of anonymous judges would wade through the submissions and choose the finalists. Finally, on Labor Day, the fair would host a big tasting, with three or four judges rating the dishes on a scale of 1 to 10 in two categories, best taste and most creative. Winners would be awarded a golden statuette, the body resembling an Academy Award, the head bobbling a likeness of Big Tex. As a result, the past five years have been a kind of golden age for our state fair concessionaires. Since the gauntlet was thrown down, complacency has been replaced by an extreme sport version of frying. Witness the fried banana split, the crispy fried cantaloupe pie, the zesty fried guacamole bites, the country fried peach cobbler on a stick, the fernies fried mac and cheese, the fried praline perfection, and the fried Italian meatballs. It may be that the Big Tex Choice Awards simply awakened a killer esprit de fry lurking in the genes of the concessionaire population. Gonzalez's two biggest challengers, Christy Urpio and Nick Burt Jr., are both from fair families. Urpio's mother was the first person to bring funnel cake to the Texas State Fair in 1980. Abel, my mother, and Skip's Fletcher, Skip Fletcher, the owner and president of the State Fair's corny dog stands, are all Woodrow Wilson High School graduates, she told me meaningfully. Bert who's, been a, <laughs> Bert, who's been a Dallas County Sheriff's deputy for 27 years, is the grandson of Samuel Bert, the inventor of the snow cone machine. These people were raised around state fair food. 350 degree oil pulsed in their veins. Gonzalez is not like them, not exactly. 
His introduction to the miraculous powers of a friar did come by way of his father, but not in a booth. Abel A.J. Gonzalez Sr. owned A.J. Gonzalez's Mexican Oven, a successful eatery in Dallas's historic West End. The business required the customary grueling hours. My father was busy all the time. My mother worked nights, so actually my grandfather, pretty, my grandmother pretty much took care of us, he said. The family had off just a few days a year to attend the state fair. They were freakishly loyal about this tradition. We are a fair family, Gonzalez explained. We were the kind of kids who used to get new outfits for the fair. I mean, it was a big deal for us. He would never missed a fair and says he would never even consider it. Gonzalez was born in November 1969 and has been to every fair since. It's safe to assume that had he been born in October 1969, he would have, been, he would have made it to that year's fair as well. By the time he had his own booth, Gonzalez was familiar enough with the traditional state fair menu that he felt himself an expert by proxy. But his outlier's conf confidence led to strange gastronomic experiments. One of his favorite creations, used to top off a deep-fried pineapple ring, is a banana-flavored whipped cream dipped in liquid nitrogen. One bite and you can literally blow smoke through your nose. My thing is something new, something nobody's done before, Gonzalez said. He's aware that this philosophy has made him something of a novelty himself. I would think a chef would look at me and kind of go, move on with your little fried self, he said. He's right. The search for the next corny dog probably would not fulfill the romantic dreams of a graduate of Le Cordon Bleu, but many would kill for a concessionaire's profits. For each four or five dollar item, Gonzalez pays the fare a 25% share. After he subtracts taxes, staff wages, and supplies, his most successful items leave him with a profit of about a dollar per plate. Now consider that in a three-week run of the fair, he can sell about 10,000 orders on a Saturday and 5,000 to 7,000 on a weekday. People always go, you must be making a million at the fair, he said. Honestly, I'm not. I make enough money so I don't have to work the rest of the year, but if I had kids or a wife, there's no way I could get away with that. Having your creation declared a finalist can increase business by 30%. A winner can increase his initial figures by six times over. Uh, in, nine, in 2009, after winning the award, Gonzalez sold about 35,000 orders of fried butter, or 140,000 total balls. If you've never deep fried anything in your life, you might be thinking at this point, how hard can it be? <laughs> Anyone can stick food in a fryer. But consider, it took the Fletcher brothers 60 attempts to produce a batter that tasted good and stayed on a weenie. Mastering the science of frying it requires know-how, but to, further, to go further and create a memorable state fair food, one must really have an artist's inspiration. The right balance must be struck between novelty and flavor. No wonder that secrecy abounds. Participants contacted for this article were evasive about their future endeavors. Ideas like fried jelly beans and fried pop rocks do not fall from the sky, and they can be quickly appropriated. Other fairs are following our lead, or P.O. explained. Last year, I won best taste for Fernie's Deep Fried Peaches and Cream on September 7th. The Texas fair didn't open until September 20-something, but Oklahoma or Kansas was having a fair September 11th, and somebody was already knocking us off. That the R&D can be brutal, burning eyes and skin, only adds to the sense of ownership. Glenn Cusack won best taste in 2008 for chicken fried bacon. We'd tried an item that contained a hot dog, he told me. The wiener exploded, and it became ugly pretty quick. One does have to wonder, however, where the line should be drawn. Milton Whitley, a high school teacher who's been a concessionaire at the state fair for 20 years, told me recently that he had battered and deep fried mud. <laughs> we had it, he said. I'll be honest, I'd forgotten this part. Uh, he wanted to change his subject, but I pressed him for details. He continued to dodge. I wondered if he was pulling my leg until I became aware he had an entirely different reason for hesitating. I'm going to get myself in trouble for bringing that up, he said. I think that's my ace in the hole this year. <laughs> How rare is that moment when the person who's drifting is overcome with a sense of purpose? The sudden obsession could be anything. Hairstyling, doll manufacturing, bass fishing. One morning he wakes up and says, this is what I need to do. This is possibly the most important milestone in anyone's life, but it sometimes takes years for the revelation, if it happens at all. Like many offspring of restaurateurs, Gonzalez first entered the family business as an unenthusiastic dishwasher, in his case, as punishment for bad behavior and bad grades. The first time I worked in the restaurant, I couldn't even reach the sink to wash dishes. I remember that, he said. It was really embarrassing because everybody knew why I was there. I was in trouble. In time, he graduated to prep chef, then cook, then manager. But the 24-hour-a-day, seven-days-a-week responsibility of a restaurant was not appealing. I'm way too lazy for anything like that, he said. Instead, when he was in his early 20s, he followed the gravitational pull of the 90s dot-com boom and landed a job 
at a direct mail marketing company. He started off in the warehouse, driving around pallets of paper. Later, he became a machine operator, and eventually he worked his way up to programmer and database analyst, a position he held for more than a decade. This profession, he discovered, was only slightly better than washing dishes. It was very boring. I was behind a desk in a cube, he said. I'd write programs all day long and surf the net and talk on the phone, take lunches, really nine to five like the movie Office Space, be at Hawaiian shirt day, casual Fridays, happy hour. He's able to laugh about it for about as long as it takes to spit the sentences out, and then he'd rather move on. That was a really rough time in my life, he said. It's 1999, after losing 20 or $30 on a ring toss game at the fair, that the notion of actually working there dawned on him. Gah, that guy's making a fortune just three weeks out of the year doing a goofy little bottle trick, he said. Gonzalez looked into operating a game booth at the fair and discovered that one company ran all the stands, so he tried another angle, concessions. Three years later, he opened his first booth, serving a giant sopapilla in the shape of Texas, covered in honey, cinnamon, whipped cream, and strawberries. It was an idea adapted from his father's restaurant, but he used bread dough instead of sopapilla dough for a more buttery flavor. The reaction was mild. He had to drag customers off the midway like a carnival barker. But even if his initial few seasons at the fair were difficult, his first year he actually lost money, he still dreaded going back to his 9 to 5 gig. I remember the first year we ended on a Sunday and we were there until 3 in the morning, he said. I was up at 7 and was at work by 8. It was terrible. That first week back to work at the, from the fair was awful. For a few years, he carried on a kind of double life as an office worker and concessionaire. Gonzalez was still living in his parents' house, even though his parents had moved out in 2000. It's really, really strange, he said. I just never left. Then in 2005, Gonzalez returned from a month-long vacation in Egypt and saw in his big pile of mail an envelope from the fair. The announcement within stated the rules for the big text competition, as well as the theme, Elvis. That made me think right away, peanut butter banana jelly sandwich, he said. Though that deadline had passed, he immediately called the head office and begged them for a late entry. They did, and a year later he dusted off his home fryer from Target and started to experiment. The product that resulted from his trials was simple and delicious, a standard PB&J sandwich with banana, battered, fried, quartered, and served dusted with powdered sugar. It won the 2005 award for best taste. Each subsequent year, Gonzalez tried to outdo himself. In 2006, he won most creative for deep-fried Coke. Smooth spheres of Coca-Cola flavored batter are deep-fried, drizzled with pure Coke fountain syrup, topped with whipped cream, cinnamon, sugar, and a cherry, read the fair guide. In 2007, he won best taste for Texas fried cookie dough. This was followed by the deep-fried pineapple ring, topped with a frozen banana-flavored whipped cream, the only entry of Gonzalez's not to win an award. By the end of 2008, he thought the attention had peaked. I'd been on ABC, I'd had done interviews in Australia and Argentina, he said. I was taking stock of everything and I was going, that was a once-in-a-lifetime trip. I'm never going to have that again. Oh, how wrong he was. <laughs> in 2009, he figured out a way to deep fry a pat of butter. The concept alone was going to attract people. He knew that. But he had no idea how it would take off. Though it had, has a long way to catch up with the corny dog, fried butter can now be found at fairs around the country. It's just amazing, he said. One night, a friend called me up and said, you're on Letterman's top ten. And I was like, no freaking way. The late night comedian deadpan, this is why the rest of the world hates us. <laughs> before launching into his top 10 questions to ask yourself before eating fried butter. The money was good, but the real payoff was something unexpected for a concessionaire. Fame. I mean, all of a sudden TV programs like Oprah come to your booth and you're a star, he said. For those three weeks, you're it. At age 40, Abel Gonzalez discovered that he had a gift. It wasn't necessarily deep frying. It was coming up with bizarre concepts. Did you ever watch The Honeymooners, he asked? The whole show revolves around this guy coming up with mega million ideas. And I swear, I'm like, Kim, I come up with all these ideas. One of his proposals is a 30-minute TV show starring himself, trying to solve problems in the kitchen like a one-man culinary A-team. Hopefully someday somebody will be interested in it, he said. The show's conceit summed up what Gonzalez hoped would be his legacy. There's that idiot. He doesn't know anything, but he figured it out. The day before I met Gonzalez to his test kitchen, I called him to ask if, in addition to specialties like fried butter, he could prepare some experimental items. I wanted to get a sense of the R&D process. Friends had suggested that I have Gonzalez fry, among other things, a feather, an origami bird, and a small boot, but he had his own array of challenges in mind. On a large steel brush table, he laid out his ingredients. Aunt Jemima buttermilk pancake mix, a can of Dole fruit cocktail, a bag of powdered sugar, a box of Bisquick, 
a big bag of microwave popcorn, a jag of confection sprinkles, a can of pineapple rings, a whisk, tongs, a skimmer spoon, and a few red mixing bowls. The deep fryer, measuring about two feet by three feet, sat adjacent to the steel industrial stove, heating a vat of oil. Gonzales is a natural performer. He, natu he narrates the frying process with the verve of a cooking show veteran, complete with humming punctuated by exclamations. One of the first things he fried for me was a fruit cocktail. Let's get as much of this excess liquid out as we can, he said, pushing the lid down. Then he flipped the lid and spooned the contents into a mixing bowl of prepared pancake mix. Put that in there. He walked to the fryer and began scooping it in, but almost immediately things went awry. No, 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 don't turn into a blob, he shouted. We might have a failure. He moved the pieces around with a mesh skimmer spoon. It's not adhering to the batter, he said, pulling the unidentifiable brown bits out of the vat and tossing them onto a plate. I don't know what happened. We'll put some powdered sugar on that. He popped a piece in his mouth and motioned that it was so-so. Man, I don't know what kind of fruit I just had. Cringing, he gave his verdict. No fried fruit cocktails, not a success. We made our way through the remaining ingredients on the table. We tried the pineapple ring. Palate cleanser, he said. The butter, the popcorn, whose battered kernels withered into flavorless beige blobs. Eventually, he got around to his personal Mount Everest, something so impossible to fry, he hadn't even laid it out on the table to begin with. Lettuce. His kitchen monologue revealed his conflicted emotions about this undertaking. I love it, he said as he pulled a plastic box of pre-cut romaine out of the refrigerator. He popped it open and stared at his ingredients. This is just going to be awful, he said, shaking his head. We're going all the way. The level of difficulty of fried lettuce is pretty high up there, right near a 10. It's novel for sure. Whether or not it can be good is questionable. And all this is moot if it doesn't survive the fryer. Anything plunged into 350 to 375 degree oil loses moisture quickly, and a romaine leaf is about 95% moisture to begin with. The bubbles you see on the surface of a pot of boiling oil are the water molecules escaping from whatever is being fried. This is how frying works. It sucks away moisture, creating a crispy shell around a hopefully juicy center. The starch in a potato gives a French fry sufficient toughness to withstand this experience, one that, needless to say, spells death to a lettuce leaf. Gonzales's batter, therefore, had to be perfect to keep the lettuce from going limp. He had selected a bisquake batter. He tossed the leaves from his salad box into this red mixing bowl and continued his monologue. This is good, you know. Maybe it's not going to come out that bad. I try to be optimistic, but I just assume it's going to be bad until I actually work with it. He let the leaves soak in the batter for a moment. I think this lettuce is going to fall apart on us. I always think that whatever you're frying is like a little baby, and you have to protect that baby from the heat of the fryer. Some things, some little babies are just not built, you can't take it. This is what I think when I think of the salad. Later on, when I asked Rosanna Morera, a, food, a professor in food engineering at Texas A&M, what batter she would suggest for a romaine leaf, she simply responded, I don't think that's a good idea, do you? <laughs> As Gonzalez tossed a few globs of leaves into the fryer, the oil hissed and an amoeba shape of bubbles darted for the sides of the vat. He grabbed his spoon and quickly tried to separate the pieces. I thought for sure it'd go down, he said. He hesitated. There's no way this is going to hold up. But the lettuce was not wilting. Using the skimmer spoon, Gonzalez pulled the fried leaves out of the vat and placed them in a basket on the side of the fryer. A few seconds later, he tossed about eight leaves into a, onto a dinner plate. They looked like flattened, gnarled frog's legs. I'm going to try this little piece, he said, reaching in. He chewed for about ten seconds, revealing no expression, then looked up. Not so bad. I mean, it's not disgusting. I didn't spit it out. <laughs> I took a piece. The interior was not mushy. The stalk and veins had held onto their tough, raw consistency. But unlike eating lettuce leaf from a garden, this was like lettuce on steroids. Oddly, it had a strong, earthy flavor with an unexpected crunch. Gonzalez nodded. It's not like, ooh, it's great, but yeah, it's not bad. Let's see what happens when you finish it off. Other cooks might have left well enough alone. They might have moved on to a more viable project. They might have heard the ghosts of generations of friars saying, Abel, stop! But Gonzales was compulsively interested now, and his muddling had evolved from a defeatist foray into weird food science to a culinary challenge of the highest order. He assembled the finishing touches while discussing the possibilities of an even more robust lettuce or a more ambitious batter, possibly a pesto sauce or an egg wash with breadcrumbs or a batter of Italian seasonings that would encase each leaf in its own personal crouton. <laughs> it's just so out there, he said. He drizzled Caesar, Caesar dressing on the dish and sprinkled it with shredded Parmesan cheese. We stared for a moment at what was surely the world's first deep-fried salad. Then he handed me a fork. At first I couldn't place the flavor, but as Gonzales 
started nodding and discussing its actual potential as a major draw, it dawned on, dawned on me. This was the taste of blasphemy, and it was good. Thanks, everybody.